So Alan, I hope you got that uh, other cup of coffee <laughs> there. Oh um, yes, always get your coffee yeah. in. <laughs> So um, great to have you, Alan, here. You're almost like an honorary fin by now. <laughs> yeah. Having lived here already very I, many I'm quite, years. <laughs> I'm quite embarrassed. I, don't, I can't speak as much Finnish as, as the previous guy. Yeah, it's kind of embarrassing kind of, to be here. Yeah, it's good that you understood the hint yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but um, yeah. Alan is here with his favorite topic, and you are going to challenge us on all, everything that we know about um, API portals, aren't you? You have some Absolutely. other thoughts around that. So why don't you take us away into the interesting portal journey? Absolutely. Do. Okay. Great. So as Mariuka just said, I'm going to be talking to you about the next generation of API portals, right? So, so this is me, for those of you who haven't seen me before. Um, I've been working the last 20 or so years uh, for mainly larger organizations, um, more recently at Porne here in Helsinki, but before that, Swisscom for many years in Switzerland, and then uh, quite a few companies in uh, Munich. Uh, what we're doing now is we're working on um, API portals as a service. So let's kick things off by looking at how, how I API portals are today, or up until this point in time, what we've been looking at. As Mariuka was hinting, um, you know, so far we've been building developer portals, uh, dealing with developer documentation, developer communities, uh, having examples for those developers, sandboxes, hackathons, right? This is kind of like your your more classic uh, developer experience and, uh, you know, having developer portals for your developers. And when we sort of group all this up, what we've learned over the past 10 or so years is, you know, you really need this connected developer experience. You need to speak to your developers um, in, in such a way that they can just look at your stuff and say, yeah, I get it and start working with it. And I would say we're, we're, we're kind of done here, right? So um, we can create great documentation, you know, possibly with some videos, we have SDKs, et cetera. And, and the developers are, are already quite well serviced, right? They, they understand uh, what's going on. So I, I'm giving us like an A plus when it comes to developer experience. So then we've got this question that keeps coming to me when I speak to people is, and why don't the developers come? Right, so you've built yourself a developer portal. You built it like five years ago. You set it up, and no developer came to the portal. So if we we look, for example, today I noticed on on LinkedIn that uh, Mercedes Benz have just announced their seven thousandth user of their API portal, and it's not been out that long. So that's kind of like a new benchmark for me to say, okay, well, how do you guys get up to that seven thousand uh, users of an API portal? And if we look at the reasons why they might maybe don't come, number one is that you fail to understand the whole DX thing. So as I said, that we've understood it now, you should also be able to understand it, right? It's plenty of you know documentation and white papers about what a developer wants to see, right? So maybe it's just that you know you haven't understood that and you need to go back there. Or it could also be that you know developers are just not interest, interested in your APIs. So what do we mean by that? And, and if a developer isn't interested in your APIs, well, who is interested in your APIs? So again, we've been we've been talking about developers for a long time now. Developers, developers, developers. You know the classic line, and we've been concentrating on these guys for a long long time. And I, you know, you'll be forgiven for doing this because this is what we've told you to do. But if we take a step back and say, okay, well especially as we start to work on APIs as products. If it's a product, you need to have a customer. And a customer is someone who pays for the product and the user does not. So with that in mind, the developer is probably not your target customer, right? So the customer is probably someone that you already know within your organization. 
So if you're in my previous company selling, you know, elevators and so on, target customer is more than likely going to be a, a building manager who, who owns that elevator, for example, as a customer. Uh, in the retail business, it's it's your your current customers, et cetera, right? So um, it's an important differentiator to make between customer and user. Um, I'll expand, I'll go into a little bit more detail about what I mean by that here, right? So if we say, okay, on the left side, you've got a developer, on the right side, you've got more of you know, a business persona, uh, in this case, represented by a product manager. So as a uh, developer, you're gonna want immediate access to those developer-oriented products, right? So here we're thinking, you know, along the lines of Twilio, Stripe, all those classic developer products that we have, right? On, on the business side of things, you're quite used to having agreements in place between, you know, especially B2B uh, organizations to, to get that nailed before you start doing business with one another. So developer wants to get access immediately, whereas on the business side, you're used to having this like uh, approval process maybe in place. Some example products on developer side, like I said, you know, Twilio type stuff, call forwarding, uh, you know, getting access to Google Docs, just, just stuff that's, you know, simple and easy. I found recently, I think Live Cricket Scores is one of the most used APIs on, on the internet, which is fantastic. Um, on the flip side, on more on the, on the business side, you know, no one's going to give a developer direct access to an elevator, right? Sign up to our elevator call API. It's not going to happen. Right? It's going to be a bunch of people in between. You're going to have building owners, like I said, the manufacturer of the elevator, and you're going to have, you know, the the company involved in actually, you know, bringing a robot or wherever it is to the elevator as well. On a similar vein, you know, creating a new mobile phone subscription. Um, it, there's going to be a business relationship in place before that. Tracking a vehicle location, anything to do with like really, really super sensitive data. Big agreements need to be in place before that happens, you know, creating bank accounts, all this type of stuff. So joining these two things together, and this cheesy graphics time, I love these graphics. Um, it's this, this like keyword developer enabled. Um, I, I did a, a session with Adam um, about three months ago now, I think, and he, he dropped this word developer enabled in there. And for me, it just clicked immediately to say, okay, Business products, digital products, which are API based, there are developer enabled, meaning that you need a developer in order to work with them. I think that's where we've been confused over the last years in that we know that developers need to use the APIs as a user, but we've been focusing on them as the customer where we should have been concentrating on the, you know, the business side as the customer and making them work with the developer. So more cheesy graphics. You could see this like, you know, just add developers. So when you have some food and it says on the, on the packaging where it used to in the olden days, just add water, you know, here we say, okay, just add developer, right? So um, you need a developer. And you need this trusted by developers, you know, concept within there. I'm not saying here that you can ignore the developer and the developer experience. I think everything we've learned is very valid. And any, you know, product manager or business persona that's worth the salt will go to their internal development team and say, hey, what do you think of these APIs? Can we use them? And if your APIs are rubbish, then it's not gonna work, right? So you still gotta have, you know, really good, you know, developer documentation, et cetera. But it, it's just understanding, you know, the roles of these um, different personas. So if we look ahead a little bit, okay, to, to the API portals of tomorrow, uh, as, it, as it said in the title, where are we going? What's going to be there? Um, your APIs will be more consumable. So some of the APIs out there today, you look at them, you don't really understand them. They're not very well productized, and product is the key word here. So, so making them consumable. Um, you'll have a great exp API experience when your APIs are products. Again, I'm gonna repeat myself a little bit here. APIs are products that have a clear value proposition. So you know what they're for, you know who wants to use them, you know your customer. They are consumable. Again, repeating myself, but it's important. Consumable means you can just get to it, um, you know, sign any contracts online if possible and get to them. They are monetizable, right? So 
You don't have to monetize it directly each time. It can also be a strategic initiative. You know, having a business case for your API says, okay, uh, it could be that you're trying to lock in, you know, a certain customer um, or partner to, to your uh, ecosystem. Understandable by me and models. Very important that you have before you start talking about the technical parts of the API that you give like a business overview first. So how do we present APIs as products? Well, if we look at like, you know, the developer experience, again, I think this is Stripe here. Um, one of the most beautiful API documentations you can find, right, from the developer experience part. Um, but a lot of people don't realize there's also a marketplace attached to it as well. So it's quite funny at the top of the developer documentation, there's a little link to the uh, marketplace and says, if you're a business user, click here, do not read further. <laughs> because it gets very technical. And I love the technical documentation. I, I would probably stay there, but you know, for the business guys, you know, they get pulled out and they have a marketplace with, you know, partners where, where, where it's more of a, a business view on the, the APIs, right? And it, it's more high level with fancy graphics. So stuff that a, um, a developer might not like so much. So if we drill into this a little bit and say, okay, you know, digital marketplaces versus developer portals, and when would you use each one? Well, we say a marketplace is when the decision maker is non-technical, very clear versus technical decision makers. Um, if you have APIs as products and they're well done, put them in a digital marketplace, it's the best place for a product. Um, if your API is really clear, meaning that, you know, they're, well, RESTful, a developer can just kind of look at it and go, oh yeah, I get that, that's clear. Then you could have them in a developer side. Uh, if you wish to monetize it, then you're gonna need a marketplace, right? Uh, if you can reach developers, if, if you have a already existing channel to developers, go for a developer portal. Uh, when you want a subscription model, again, playing into the monetization, but if your APIs can be found very easily, uh, then that's the way to go. And the question is, you know, should you be using both or should you concentrate on one or the other? And, uh, and the answer is you should probably be using both, right? You're gonna have this um, concept of um, different personas within your API portal. So maybe it's a developer who is coming and they just want access to the APIs, technical documentation. Don't, don't give me all this marketing stuff. I just wanna see the APIs and start working. Whereas on the business side, you know, they, they don't really bombard it with, you know, JSON, uh, you know, on, on the main page. They wanna have an idea about what this digital product does and how much it costs and, you know, sign up for it, give their credit card, et cetera, and then invite their developers. KPIs, right? KPIs for APIs. Um, this is something we've been talking about recently as well. Um, and you need to like bake them into the API portal. So the API portal is pulling this information out, right? Um, and these should be aligned to your business goals and be avoiding these vanity metrics. So, um, I mean, yeah, just pure number of people looking at your APIs, et cetera, might be classed as a vanity metric, but really having a business goal to say, okay, we wanna make money or we wanna strategically lock people in. Whatever the business goal for the API, you need to be tracking it. And, and the API pool is a great place to, to do that. Monetization, like I've said, led by the business goals, understanding, okay, what do you want to achieve with it? And then saying, okay, monetization. And we'll see more cases of this uh, as we go into this. Uh, um, I, okay, we can just do a quick section here on, you know, how to um, build the API pool of the future. So a lot of people have API portals. Some people are thinking about building uh, a new one or from scratch. And there's the basically three different ways we can go about this. One is to take it off the shelf from the API management vendor. So um, yeah, there's a lot of these API management guys out there now. There's like 15 or 20 of them, big guys, you know, Millsoft, Axway, IBM, and then there's some smaller guys like Kong, et cetera. Um, but they all come with a uh, API portal. So you can take that off the shelf and start using it. Um, like I said, they all include one of some kind and the key thing here is that, you know, it comes ready integrated. So it's basically glued together. So you don't have to do anything out of the box there. That's really cool. And enterprise architects especially love this, this concept of having everything from one, one vendor if possible. So it's all, all their eggs are in one basket, basically. 
Cons are some are better than others, right? Some are really bad, if we're being honest. Some are better. Um, some basically are there just strategically to win the sale, but you know when you actually try and use it, it's it's not that good. You can see it hasn't been upgraded in years. Can be very expensive um, if it requires like a separate license. It's not bundled in, and you could still be doing a lot of development work on top of it. You know to rebrand it, to customize it how you want it to be, and also there's the ongoing maintenance as the back end changes, as the API management portal changes. You need to you know be making sure that your API pool is getting upgraded along with it at the same time. Second thing is you could start from scratch, really hire yourself an agency software agency and go ahead and, and, and build your own portal. And the good thing about this is that you would get exactly what you want, right? Um, your branding marketing team will love you. I remember I, I, I started a growth hacking workshop. Um, it was about, well, before coronavirus, about a year ago. And at the table, there, there was a, a nice lady from the marketing team and she, she didn't know what an API was. I explained what an API was. I said, let's go and have a look at your organization. And I put developer dot. And sure enough, they had a, uh, a developer portal. And she screamed right <laughs> in the room because it, it was so far away from the corporate uh, branding style guide that uh, <laughs> she had a heart attack. So I apologize if that was your problem. Um, but it can be very expensive. You know, you're hiring a software agency, you know, 100, 150K plus to build these things. Uh, and also requires a lot of, you know, ongoing maintenance, right? You've got to be uh, upgrading this as the, the back end upgrades uh, each time can get expensive. Um, also needs a large project, right? You've got a project manager on this stuff, you know, nine, 12 months to, to build it out. You've got to really want to do this. Uh, another one which is kind of a newer things is the you know SaaS based API portal as a service. So this is where you have an API portal running in the cloud as a service, right? So a pro with this kind of thing, standard cloud pros is that you know you're getting all these continuous improvements all the time, new features, the things evolving. Um, with subscription based, no need to invest a lot of CapEx up front. So you're getting it quickly without having to dump a lot of cash into it. Um, and it's maintained as a service. So you don't have to worry about like back end changing because they will automatically get upgraded. You have multiple API gateway support, you're not locked into a vendor. So you can you can mix and match IBM with APG, with MuleSoft, with Kong, whatever you can sort of mix and match those. Cons would be that, uh, you know, if these things are hosted off premise, um, then users data needs to be secure. You need to have a, a portal vendor who is, you know, aware of that security issue. You lose control, right? Someone else is running the system. So on the one side, that's good. But if you're a very controlling organization, that could be bad. And there are very few API portals as a service out there. So hands up if you didn't see this coming. <laughs> so APIable uh, has produced an API portal as a service. And we're calling it like the next generation API portal. So we've been taking a look at what has and hasn't been working uh, with current API portals. And we're really baked into it the secret source on how to have a good portal. Um, if you want right now, we can do you a demonstration of what we've got. Um, this is from the, the prototype that we built last year, but since then we've been developing for our pilot customers um, a new development, which is uh, starting to shape up very nicely. Again, it's technology agnostic, meaning that you can put whatever underlying uh, API gateway underneath that you like, or you can have multiple and we will build on top of that. Uh, with IDP integration, of course, and those roles-based uh, personas that I was talking about before. And it has like the marketplace concept. So really taking, okay, developer journey and, uh, and, and then the business journey at the same time. I guess if we're deploying our, for our pilot customers right now, so, so we're doing those, you know, up until like May, early June timeframe. So if you're in the market for an API portal this year, talk to us and uh, we can definitely uh, see if we can help you out. So that's how you get in touch, API able or apiable.io. And uh, yeah, feel free to get in touch or visit the booth today. I'll be there the whole day. So just uh, get in touch. Yes, 
And thank you, Alan. It was great as usual. And you are kind of flying in the hybrid clouds. And we, we are all using so many clouds in, in the architecture that we end up with a lot of portals. And I used to say after like uh, every client session that we had that, yes, there is no way to kind of combine these, <laughs> all of these portals to one portal because everybody wanted that. And now you have created that. So yes. it has been interesting to see. So there is like one question here in the chat for you. I promise to give the next Alan with one L. We have this Alan track um, uh, plenty of time because he says he's drowning his slides. But Heimo uh, has a question. What does API gateway integration mean here? Getting schema and descriptions from the gateway. So, so what does API gateway integration API mean? Integration. Yes. OK, yeah. So every uh, API management solution um, has, you know, like the, the meta APIs, the management APIs that control that gateway, right? Mm -hmm. And with the correct API key, you can access those APIs. And when you access those APIs, you can get access to all of the API proxies from that organization. So it could be, you know, customer data or wherever. Uh, and so what we can do when we've got access to that is expose those as products um, on the portal. So, so that's, you know, the most common way you would take an API portal um, at the moment. You would take your underlying API management gateway and then just put a portal on top of it. So that's what we do. And what we can also do is, you know, as Mario could just said, we can take multiple uh, API gateways because believe it or not, within these larger organizations, there are multiple uh, API management solutions in place. You know, line of business might have one. Uh, IT will definitely have one. You can find like the IoT guys will have one, right? Before you know it, in order to uh, a developer to, you know, have a certain use case, they need to sign up at three separate portals, right? And uh, mm -hmm. that's suboptimal. So what we do is we come in over the top of all of those API gateways, and then we 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 create you know combined products effectively. Yeah, and, and that's an interesting development in the API management. It, it's it's kind of like everybody started to have their own SaaS tools around the company or or other things. And suddenly, um, these API management tools come in the shape of not looking like API management tools, actually. Yeah.